Good morning. Good morning. Pastor John. Well, you have heard testimonies from two of our elders, and there's two of us left. So that's Dean and I. So I'm going to give you my testimony, and then Dean will come up and get his. We feel it's only fair that as covenant members on the application, we'd ask you for your um, story of how you came to Christ. We feel it's only fair that we give our story to you. So um, that's what we're going to do this morning. And I'm going to time it because I've been given just a few uh, short minutes to do that. Aaron seems to want plenty of time <laughs> to be funny. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm one of those people, and probably some of you are that way too. I always felt like I wished I had a more powerful testimony. You know, I wasn't in prison or drug addict or anything like that. But as a Christian, we each have our own story. And no one can refute that story. And that's why our testimony is so important. Uh, when you're sharing with someone to come to the love of Jesus Christ, that's the one thing that you can, besides scripture, is your story on how you came to know Christ. So I encourage you all to, to really think about your testimony and just have it stored in your RAM so you can quickly grab it and share it when, when the opportunities come, because God does give us those opportunities. Um, I think there's also many testimonies that each of us has. There's a testimony of how we came to Christ, and then we have testimonies even after that. As we've lived as Christians, God gives us testimonies to many things and how um, the struggles we've gone through as Christians. And, but Obviously, today I'm going to concentrate on my testimony to how I came to Christ. I was raised in the Lutheran Church, which probably many of you were um, growing up in this area. Of course, um, that is one of the top denominations. I was a good Lutheran. I, my parents actually did take us to church most every Sunday. We missed very few. I went through all the classes that we needed to do, um, got to take my first communion, all that. Um, continued to, to try to go to church even when I went to college, but as I was in college, um, I was there for five years, and as I was in college, I tended to start to fall into some of those traps that kids do, the drinking and the partying and things like that. Um, I grew up in an alcoholic family, and I always said I would never, ever, never, ever, ever let that be a problem. But even so, in college, I still let that happen to me. Started to drink. Nothing, I would say, crazy, but but I did, and wished I hadn't, of course. Um, in 1984, 1985, my dad got saved. Um, I don't honestly know what exactly happened, how he did that, or what, who, who talked to him, but he, he got saved, and he was on fire for the Lord, and he's the one that actually talked to me about maybe attending a Bible preaching church, whether it be Baptist or whatever. So I took that to heart, and um, it's kind of hard to walk into a church you've never been into before, but I had a friend who invited me to a Baptist church in Rapid City, where I was at at the time. Went to that first service, and of course I've never experienced an altar call. And I think it was the second Sunday I was there, I was hanging onto that pew so tight, my knuckles were white. Many of you probably recognize that. Finally, I had to walk forward. And so that was, that was when I uh, became saved, when I realized that I needed that personal relationship with Christ. Later that week, two men came from the church, talked to me about my uh, relationship with Christ, and I again um, confirmed that I wanted to be a follower of Christ. So that's, that's how I became uh, saved. And as many 
Christians do. I had my uh, fallbacks. You know, you miss church a few times and it just gets easier and easier to miss. And then um, I met my wife. And that's what brought me back into the fold. But I can't, get, I can't tell her testimony for her, so you'll have to ask her about that. <laughs> so I just praise God that, that he um, worked in my life and brought me in as a, as a son of his. And I cannot thank him enough for that. All right. Talking about it in the last meeting, I thought, nah, there's a way. Yeah, don't worry about it, we'll get it done. And I went to the chief and I, and I said, hey, you know, they'd like me to speak at uh, church on Sunday. Good. Um, I'm not going to speak about law enforcement. <laughs> I'm not giving one of those demonstrations or anything. And he said, fine. Uh, so then I, I sat down with him and, and uh, told him, you know, he, he knows about the church. We talked a lot about it. And I uh, told him that uh, being an elder, I was asked to give my testimony. He again thought that was wonderful. So here I am. My name is Dean Larson. If I haven't met you, I hope to uh, hope to meet you. Uh, like Jeff and, and Aaron had said, we um, met some great people. It was fun to uh, get faces and names and everything. So don't hesitate to come up to us to uh, introduce yourselves. That that's great. My testimony was a lot like a lot of the other elders while we were going around the, the, the table at, at Jeff's home one night, in that I grew up in church. Uh, my parents always, from day one, uh, brought me to church. Even on vacation, we had to go to church. So it was Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning worship. It was Sunday evening worship and Wednesday night for as long as I can remember. It wasn't really until church camp, a lot of times that's um, you know, where you really start thinking a little bit more about it and, and where I accepted God in church camp. Um, a couple of the people last week had asked me about my testimony and I shared briefly with them. And what I said was, I've always been a believer, but that being said, is just that I believed I knew there was God. I knew what Jesus did for me and for all of us. I was a believer, but I wasn't always a follower. I didn't do all the things that I should do, and you know, but it was always with me. Went through once in a night youth group with Doug and stuff, um, Jet Cadets, you know, I, if, you, uh, if you knew anything about Jet Cadets, we had these awesome little uniforms, and uh, I guess it just stuck with me all these years, you know, we had medals and, and everything, so, um, but through, even up in, uh, through college, still attended church, was a part of InterVarsity, uh, had a, a youth group, or a, a Bible study during the, the week, um, but, you know, I just put my time in. And uh, that's, I met my wife in college. And that's, you know, we, we had a lot of great conversations uh, about religion and, and about uh, God and everything. And, but I just still kind of did my thing, just kept coming to church and um, periodically would really be convicted by something and, and I would confess and then I would be following for a while and then back to uh, just being a believer. We moved to Illinois back in uh, around 1990, and we were invited to a church uh, by some friends. And unfortunately, the, we started going, and then the friends stopped going. But um, we became members of that church. Uh, I was baptized, but not uh, by immersion. Um, if you're kind of wondering why it was just a few weeks ago, I was baptized. Uh, but that, that was the reason. I, I was baptized back in the 90s with uh, uh, kind of a sprinkling and and we became members of a church, but we 
we again, it was a large church. We went for the sermons. We uh, got a lot out of it. We became kind of close to the pastor before he left. Um, we even went to Des Moines to go to his church. Um, it, it was great. Well, when we moved back, uh, of course, we moved back for family, and we wanted to be closer to to family, have our, our raise our family here. And uh, we're in a larger church again. Um, in my work, I, I built a lot of walls. Um, I guarded myself. You know, I, I couldn't uh, um, show emotion. And I still struggle with uh, not being able to show emotions, but it's been great with the elders. Uh, they've heard my voice crackle a few times while we've shared things. And I, I would never have done that with anybody else. Um, just one of those one of those walls that's slowly being taken down. And, and I really appreciate that. So a few weeks ago, or I guess it was a few months ago really, but uh, uh, sitting and having an elder meeting and finding out uh, that next section is uh, covenant membership by immersion. And I went home freaking out thinking, I, I haven't done this. What? Now what? I didn't sleep that night. I called Pastor John and he said, well, you got a problem with it? No? Okay. Then we'll do it, um, you know, when we had our camp out. So a little rush then to make sure everything was done properly and everything. And um, it, It's been great. Now as not only a believer but a follower and continuing to uh, grow and learn and um, hopefully be able to share well with you and grow with you guys. So it's it's been awesome. This has been a great experience. So my second assignment will be for the scripture reading for today's, uh, if you all stand. We'll be reading Galatians 4, if you have your Bible. Galatians 4, 1 through 9, it'll also be up here on the, on the screen. I mean that their heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under the guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn your back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Who slaves you? Want, who slaves you want to become once more? Please help me understand why. Um, like, why did God do it? 
Why did God send Jesus? Why did God sacrifice his son? Why did Jesus submit to God's plan and allow himself to be beaten beyond recognition? Why would Jesus agree to carry his own cross through the streets so he could be mocked and, and taunted and, and spat on? Why would he do that? Have you ever thought about those whys? I mean, have you ever really thought, why would somebody do that for you? For me? Me, a sinner, a sinner that can't get out of my own way uh, from sinning. Why would he do that? Today we're going to look at some of those whys, and uh, before I get started, I do have a confession to make. Uh, some of you are well aware of this, but I have a bromance, a brotherly romance uh, with Matt Chandler. Um, Matt is a, uh, the lead pastor in uh, Dallas, Texas at the Village Church. For those who were with us uh, that first uh, couple weeks in March, he's the guy that was over the speakers that we listened to his sermon. And so, because of my uh, man crush on Matt, I do need to uh, give him credit. Basically, anything that's good that comes out of my mouth, that's probably his. Uh, and so, uh, again, um, I've always been amazed uh, at pastors who can take one or two verses and, and really dive into it and really uh, pull things out that, that I, I never have been able to. And luckily for you, I'm not a pastor, so uh, we're not going to be here for an hour doing that. Uh, but I'm going to jump around a little bit and, uh, and just look at a couple verses, starting with the one that Dean just read. Uh, Galatians 4, verse 4. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, one of the, the whys that you can pull out of this uh, is right there, is born of a woman. Why was Jesus born of a woman, or more specifically, why was Jesus born to Mary? And, uh, you know, P.J., talked about it uh, during, during Advent. He talked about Christ's humble uh, beginning, Christ's humble coming, uh, how he didn't just come and have the, the greatest hotel or the greatest hospital. He wasn't uh, born in, in Rome. He wasn't born in, in Paris. He was born in a small town of Bethlehem. And, and, and why is that significant? Why is it significant that Christ didn't just appear? I mean, certainly God could have spiced up this arrival thing a little bit with a, a flamboyant flash of light or, or a, a supersonic boom uh, that, I'm here. I mean, God could do that, but he doesn't. Why does God, why does Christ come born of a woman? This is, a, this is significant that he doesn't just appear. He was born, uh, which if you think back to the Old Testament days, so Jesus is born to a Jewish couple, which means he's born under the law, so he uh, followed the Jews, followed the Ten Commandments. And uh, for those who were in our, our study uh, at the end of last year, when we were studying the Ten Commandments, we talked about how despite all of our efforts, we will continuously fail at, at, at keeping uh, these commandments because our hearts are naturally dark. And so, you know, example, we didn't need to teach our kids how to be selfish or how to hit. Uh, we didn't need to, you know, had to teach us how to sin. We were able to uh, uh, nail that all on our own. And so, we could do a, a quick exercise and, and be reminded that we're not alone uh, in our sinning. Uh, what the heck, let's do it. Okay, this is a safe place. Uh, how many of you, show your hands, uh, have ever stolen anything? Go ahead, raise your hand. A couple of you have stolen something, okay. How many of you have ever told a lie? Okay, kids look around. Everyone should be raising their hand. If you're not raising your hand, go ahead and raise your hand. <laughs> so, we can admit that we're thieving liars if we continue on the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, Jesus talks about if you lust after somebody, uh, you are committing adultery in your heart. Uh, if you have hated somebody, you have murdered them. And so on and on we can go down the list. And as we studied, if you have failed at keeping one of the commandments, you have failed at keeping them all. And so we can say uh, quite uh, it openly that, that we are sinners. Uh, but the question then is, why is that bad? And, and why is sin bad? 
And so uh, Mary stole some of my thunder this morning uh, with Isaiah uh, 59, verse 2. Uh, I think Isaiah answers this uh, question beautifully. Uh, why is sin bad? But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Our iniquities, our sin, make it impossible for us to stand in front of a holy God. Do we get that? I mean, do we get that if, if God is holy, he cannot be in the presence of our sin? And so, if that's true, if we believe that to be true, then we would all be condemned to hell by our own admission that, that we are sinners. And that would be the case if God didn't intervene. And, and so, why does he intervene? Again, going back to Galatians 4, you know, why is it significant that Christ was born of a woman? By being born and not just appearing, Christ is entering the same sinful world that we are, that we are in. But Christ is different. While you and I can't obey one rule, Christ obeys all of the rules. He literally breaks none. And he says to us, if we will believe in him, if we will follow him, he will take our sinfulness and impute his righteousness to us. So as Paul continues on in, in Galatians, he's going he's to play this out a little bit further uh, and, and explain to us why the Holy Spirit is necessary. Verse 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because you are sons, for those who have accepted Christ, God sent the Spirit of His Son into where? Our hearts. It's important to know that Christ didn't come to give us more rules. We already had rules. We already knew the rules. We just couldn't follow them. So Christ doesn't come to give us more rules. He comes to give us something for our hearts. Our dirty, darkened hearts. And God gives us the Holy Spirit for that. And it's exactly what we need. The, the, the Holy Spirit, the, the sensation, the, the angst, the, I guess, internal shiver that you may get when uh, you fall back into uh, whatever it is you're struggling. Maybe an addiction. Maybe when you lash out at a spouse or uh, can't shut that computer screen off. Uh, that, that feeling, that's the Holy Spirit working us and working for us, sanctifying us. And uh, God's giving that to us because He knows that's what we need, not uh, more rules or, or more laws. And uh, continuing on in verse 7, So if you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son then an heir through God, no longer a slave to sin. Uh, so sin doesn't go away because we try not to sin. I think we can all uh, agree to that. Sin's stranglehold uh, gets loosen when we find something more beautiful, more desirable than that sin. And it's the Holy Spirit that's going to make that more beautiful, more desirable known to us. But a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. And ultimately that's, that's God's end game here. Uh, so why did Jesus, why did God send Jesus? So the adoption could be complete. So God wants to call us his sons and daughters. He's adopting us into his heavenly home so we can share in the inheritance of eternal life. Going back to the five-year-old, but why? Uh, why would God want me and his family? Again, we, we admitted that we're sinners. Uh, to answer that why, uh, we need to look at uh, Malachi 1. And uh, you probably don't even need to turn there. You've got Malachi memorized, I'm sure. Uh, for those who don't, we'll put it up on the screen. Um, I have loved you, says the Lord. You know, what's interesting about this, again, building on the adopting father illustration, this is where the father begins. He begins with love. He doesn't begin with us doing anything. He begins with love. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, I've shared some stories uh, where I had a chance to talk with people, uh, and a couple of years ago I was down at... Uh, the, the ballpark and ran into a little, I don't know, fifth, sixth grader and got to talking to him and asked him what he thought was on the other side of death. And, and he said, oh, heaven. And I said, oh, okay, how, how do you get to heaven? And, and he said, well, by being a good person. 
said, oh, okay. How do, you, how do you know if you've been good enough? I said, is there someone keeping score? And, and, and he said, yeah, Jesus. I was like, okay, so the kid knows Jesus, but he's got a little, little mixed up. Again, he's a fifth grader, so I'm giving him a pass. And uh, I asked him a couple of questions, and then he got ADD and left. But uh, it, was a good, uh, it was a good start. Anyway, uh, I told him to find out a little bit more about that Jesus guy. And, uh, but it's, it's amazing. As, as I'm talking to a fifth grader, I'm thinking, okay, that's where we need to continue to work with our youth and, and continue to work uh, with our children to, to make sure that they really get it. It's not about being good. Well, then a couple of months ago when we're walking down the street uh, here downtown, we run into some more people and having the same conversation. How do you, you know, what, what's on the other side? When you die, what's out there? And you'll hear heaven occasionally or not. But for those that were, were, were believing in heaven and, and believing that that's uh, the way that it's going to be when they die, again, we'd, we'd play that out. How do you get there? Well, I'm, I'm a good person. And that's scary. Uh, that's people in our community, uh, people that are literally walking on that sidewalk, that they know the story of God, they may know the story of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. And because of that, Jesus certainly doesn't, don't know them. And I think it's just, it's so important for us to know that it's not about us. It's not about what we can do. It's not about what you can do. It's not about what you can give. It's about what Jesus already did for us. And it starts with God having loved us. I heard uh, Mark Driscoll use the analogy Religion is like a man that walks into an orphanage and says he will observe the children for a while and then adopt the best one. The God of the Bible walks into the orphanage, says I'm going to adopt a whole lot of kids. Some of them are horrible, rebellious, terrible. The whole reason they're still here. Nobody else wants these kids. And I'm going to love them, and my love is going to change them, and because I am their father, I will see what becomes of them. I just think that's such a powerful illustration of God's desiring his, his loving uh, love for us. You know, what's interesting in, in Malachi, if you, if you read that verse again, I have loved you, says the Lord. What should our response be to that? I mean, how do you almost instinctively respond when somebody says, I love you? I love you too. But well, watch how these people have responded. Verse 2 continues. But you ask, how have you loved us? Now, this is where the message can, can take a couple different uh, roads, uh, I guess depending on where you're at uh, in your life. Uh, for those of you who are in a good spot right now, life's good, job's good, marriage is good, kids obey, just with looks. Uh, if that's you, if you're in that spot, uh, praise God for that. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Praise God that you're walking faithfully uh, in His presence. But for others of you, the question of how have you loved me uh, maybe doesn't seem so far off base. Maybe you're struggling with depression and, and can't shake the hold that it has on your, your thoughts or your mood. Uh, maybe your marriage is a wreck and, and the only one that knows it is you and your, your spouse. Or, or maybe you're feeling trapped, your anxiety is, is weighing you down and you just want God to, to take that weight off and He's not answering your prayer. Or not how you want Him to. If that's you, if that's where you're at, then asking the question, how have you loved me, God? perfectly legitimate question. A perfectly legitimate question that God has already answered. Uh, God demonstrates His own love for us. His own what? His own love for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So why does God send Jesus? Why did God send Jesus for us? Because he wants to adopt us into his family. Why does he want you and his family? Because he loves you. 
I want to share a clip that is going to drive this point home uh, a lot better than I ever could. Uh, and again, regardless of where you're at, uh, a believer, a non-believer, uh, in a good spot, or as we sang in the dark night of the soul, um, God wants you in his family. And why? Because he loves you. His son, perfect, spotless, blameless. Not because of anything that you've done, but because of what Jesus did. Uh, John 1.12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So I ask, are you a, are you a son, a, a daughter of God? And if you can answer yes to that question, uh, then I have a special request for you. Um, can I just ask that you pray right now? Uh, pray for the person in this room that may not be uh, able to say yes to that question. I need you to pray for that person that maybe isn't ready to give up the sin, that doesn't believe that God loves him or her. Maybe they believe falsely that they have out sinned the sacrifice of Jesus uh, that, that he made on the cross. And pray that the Holy Spirit will grab hold of that person and, and inspire them to respond. And as you pray, believe that God hears your prayer and will answer your prayer. If you can't answer yes to the question, are you a child of God, then I have to ask one last time, why? God loves you. Do you believe that? For God so loved the world. Did you hear that? For God so loved the world. There's a, a longing in that verse. He doesn't just love you. He so loves you that he gave his son for you. If you can't answer yes to that question and, and don't know why, why don't you come up and ask one of the elders to pray with you? Uh, maybe, maybe you know the story of of Jesus, but for whatever reason, maybe there's a sin in your life that, that you can't let go of. Maybe you don't want to let go of it. Or maybe you think that God can't forgive you for whatever you did. To, you think that you're the one person that the cross doesn't cover. If, if you believe that, uh, just ask you to come and, and pray with one of the elders. Remember, Christ went to the cross knowing you were going to be messy. And yet, while you were still messy, Christ died for you. Because he loves you. You can't out sin the cross, but you must repent and turn away from that sin. If you want prayer uh, with one of the elders, come on up. Today is the day to be adopted into his everlasting love.